Although the League's discourse is clear and astute on political level, it's not particularly refined on the ideological one. Nevertheless, while it has fought forcefully delegitimated de major national symbols since its beginnings, the Lega has used and reversed symbols once used to construct the myths of the Risorgimento like the one of the Lega Lombarda, the Giuramento di Pontida. And the invention of new rituals, such as the baptism in the waters of the river Po, the reinvention of a Celtic solar symbol, are part of this construct, in stark opposition to the rituals and the symbols, as well as the values of the Italian state. Incidentally, none of these rituals tied to water and the soil can be given space in museums. For many years, Umberto Bossi has repeatedly uh, made uh, decidedly insulting remarks concerning the national flag, the tricolor, and more recently, the Northern League councillors of the regional administration of Lombardy and Emilia walked out of the council chamber when the national anthem was played on the occasion of the 150th anniversary celebrations. Recent scandals involving Prime Minister Berlusconi have further communicated at, by, at, by at different levels a sense of fragmentation and division. A feature, moreover, which also characterized the deeply divided opposition. This, therefore, has been the, the political setting for the 150th anniversary celebration and the invitation by the President of the Republic, Napolitano, to look for elements that unite rather than divide and also to draw on history for a shared identity. Celebrations started quietly. With few exceptions, they were the result of an astonishing enthusiasm which generated a myriad of initiative, initiatives, either directly connected with the official celebration or independent from them at the level of civil society, celebrating the birth of the unified state in order to reaffirm the value of the institutions and the shared history, in short, of a national community and the sense of enhanced citizenship. It is clear in this context that the focus of national history consisted of the Risorgimento, the process of national unification and construction of the unitary state. But here it is necessary to emphasize a third point, that of the public use of history. At the political level, the response of the Lega was clear. The Risorgimento had been a controversial process and the annexation of the SAD had only brought problems. Neither Garibaldi nor unification were matters for celebration. <coughs> the more reactionary Catholic front brought up the black legend of the Risorgimento, emphasizing and exaggerating the myriad of insurrections against the so-called Jacobin Republic of 1796-99, which had imported the secular model extraneous to Italian culture. They also cited the resistance raised again the unif against the unification process in southern Italy in the early 80s, the so-called brigantaggio. The argument of a master narrative, uh, 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 the, uh, the argument uh, used was, uh, was the one of a master narrative which had always hidden the dark side of the unification uh, process an argument useful in less refined arenas. These narratives centered on the effect of scandal and complicity produced by presenting the true story, so-called true story, as a discovery finally uh, revealed, revealed has some effect on non-professionals and on a broad public. These uh, revisionist authors have had thus an evident impact on the press and on the web, where ordinary people with whom professional historians hardly communicate also gain an idea of the history of Italy. For them, 
the only true Italian national experience involving all social classes and not only a top-down process has always been Catholic. Conversely, liberal and democratic ideas originating from the French Revolution were entirely foreign to the Italian national character. Last but not least, they label Giuseppe Mazzini as a totalitarian. Both these fronts propose a history of Italy in which a native Italian character, on the one hand ethnic and on the other religious, predominate. The conception of an ethnic nationalism. They uh, extol the various moments of struggles against the, against the Turks in the past, see the site on the Battle of Lepanto, and foment hostility against immigrants, against the new and non-Catholic Italians. At stake also is the legit delegitimation of the foundations of a democratic culture, which on the one hand proposes loyalty to the Constitution, and on the other, openness to immigrants. In truth, something has changed in recent months, especially on the part of the church, which uh, has clearly distanced itself from these positions, but not without contradictions. The declaration of last September 20th that the church largely contributed to the Risorgimento inev inevitably raises on another front further questions. To be sure, in early 1848, Pius IX, the Pope was favorable to the movement for a constitution and independence but he very soon withdrew his support for the national movement, and there ensued a long period of opposition between state and church, with the latter not recognizing the new kingdom of Italy. It is in this complicated context and climate of great divisivita, therefore, that also the proposal of a new museum of Italy's history should be framed. But from when should this history begin? with the Unitarian nation state, as argued by Croce, or with the Middle Ages, as the scholars of the mid 19th century thought, with the Romans, or with the ancient Italic people? And to what extent can one conceive of a geographical area that is entirely Italian? Should account not also be taken of how the history of the peninsula is interwoven with that of the world in terms of trade, on cultural exchange, political interactions in the Mediterranean and European sphere, and in that of old and new globalization. Galli della Loggia and Carandini uh, do, no, do no more than launch an appeal. They make no reference to these questions. They emphasize their impression that uh, there are lacks uh, knowledge, uh, that there lacks knowledge and awareness of the community in which we live. And they ask, who could, either, who could ever feel politically or ideologically offended by such a proposal? Who could be against a place where, alongside a codex of the divine comedy and a collection of votive offerings, there appears the interior of a nation jail, where together with Galileo's telescope, one sees a Sicilian sulfur spring, where the inside of the Milanese drawing room of the age of the Enlightenment appears next to the barrow of a Neapolitan water cellar, or reconstructions of the battle of the First World War, where it is understood what migration meant for millions of Italians, where the interior of the first radio broadcasting studio is exhibited together with the De Chirico painting of a piazza or the plan of a Roman municipium, the model for numerous towns in the peninsula." End of quote. The problem, however, with this broad and inclusive array of items, which does not comprise immigration and the new problems of inclusion, not the country's Catholic identity, but rather the representation of conflicts and division, is that it is difficult to imagine a single place in which all these exhibits could be assembled. In short, a single museum, which would indeed be complicated to create for such a composite and multi-layered country like Italy. A few voices have taken up positively, albeit, albeit cautiously, the proposal made by both parts of a fragmented, but nevertheless highly polarized political alignment. 
The most significant of them, I believe, is that of Alberto Melloni, who has cast doubt on the idea of one single museum because this might give rise to an assertive master narrative typical of the exhibitionary complexes of which Tony Bennett has spoken so well. Melloni has instead emphasized the need to construct a network of museums starting with those that already exist. And this is a proposal with which I can agree. <laughs> 